Welcome to another episode of Charlie Cat Presents. Thank you for being with me today. Uh, today we're going to look at uh, Native American Indian pottery from here in Michigan, extending from the early woodland uh, period, which dates from um, 3000 to 2200 uh, before present, years before present, through the middle woodland, which was 2200 to 1500 BC, or P, BP, excuse me. And then the late woodland, which was 1500 to 500 BP, ended at cultural contact with the first Europeans when they came in here. But before I begin, I want to wish you all a happy Memorial Day. Um, my dad served in the front lines in Italy in World War II. And uh, I, I would just want to salute my dad. He was one of the, he was a good man. Best father anybody could have ever asked for, truly. And my mother was the same. She was the best mom anybody could have ever asked for. And they're both gone home to be with the Lord Jesus now. But I don't think there's a day passes that I don't miss them and miss them more. But I remember uh, my dad had, uh, we won't get to the pottery, okay, but I remember my dad had some funny expressions when I was a kid. And Two stick in my mind, and I want to keep this a family channel. Now, the first one doesn't have to do with pottery, but it just came to mind. Um, there was my bro two brothers and my sister and I, and we were always asking if you'd see mom, where's mom, you know, like kids do. And uh, you get this funny look on his face and say, you know what? Your mom went to shit and the hogs got her. <laughs> I never figured that out, even now, but I know when I was a kid, I always wondered, well, why didn't you just use the bathroom? And then I wondered, what did she do to make the pigs so mad that they went after her? <laughs> eh, well, anyways. <clears throat> the other one uh, was about a pot. It was about a pot. But before I tell you that, let me tell you about this pot I'm holding up. This was made by a friend of mine up in Curran, Michigan, and by the name of Jordan Lubin. And he did it just exactly as the Native Americans of that area, era, area would have done. He went out and gathered the clay, processed it, built the pot, and he even decorated it with uh, the same motif that I found on many, many uh, pottery shards from up in Oscoda and a few from down here in Saginaw. But anyways, the story. My dad, oftentimes, if we were talking about somebody that didn't have a lot of money, he would often say, they don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. Well, he could be proud of me because I have the pot, though I haven't done that in it nor am I ever likely to, and I do have a window to throw it out of, actually quite a few. <laughs> but, you know, those old expressions are, are interesting, okay, nonetheless. Enough of that. The early woodland pottery that I'm going to show you <clears throat> is from here in Saginaw, the same groundhog holes as the bone artifacts that I showed you in the last episode. So they are interconnected. Um, more than likely of the same era and uh, having said that just uh, another note next week I am going to be showing you more Native American pottery but it's going to be from different parts of the country uh, the uh, from Georgia some beautiful pottery shards that my son David bought me for my birthday a number of years ago and some wonderful shards from the southwest where the Indi Native American Indians did and are still doing some amazing pottery work. So I probably bored you enough with my prattlings. Let's get to taking a look at some of the early woodland pottery. Okay. Before I show you the late woodland pottery, I want to show you a couple of the sources that I'm using for this video. And the first is this book by Doreen Oscar, and it was published by the Michigan or the Museum of Anthropology at the University of Michigan, and it's titled "An Early Woodland uh, Com Community at the Schultz Site in the Saginaw Valley, and the Nature of the Early Woodland Adaptation in the Great Lakes Region." It's rather technical, but it has some good uh, images of the of the excavations and photos, comparative photos. And also, um, 
even though it's technical, most of it's easy to understand for a layperson like myself. Then also, <clears throat> I'm going to be using this. And this is a booklet that I wrote and sold on eBay a number of years ago. It details my work up in the Ascota, Michigan area, uh, which some of it dealt with the late woodland, or excuse me, early woodland, especially a burial uh, scene that I describe in here. And then it also deals too with the uh, middle <clears throat> and late woodland. It is no more, no longer being produced by me. And that's the last copy I have. So having said that, let me briefly tell you a little about <clears throat> the early woodland period. The dawning of the early woodland period saw many cultural changes take place. And as the late archaic period was drawing to a close, pottery came into use and its use was expanded in the early woodland period. Um, I wonder how it was introduced to the, to the late archaic people even. You know, was it just, did they spontaneously, somebody think, well, it would be good to take this clay and bake it? And, but I don't know. I've never heard an adequate explanation for how pottery came to these people. Well, I've heard the Native American explanation for it, but it's, uh, you know, based in mythology. But it's pretty interesting, but we're not going to do that right now. Uh, the pottery was primitive at this time. It was very thick, and it had large, very coarse tempering. Now, tempering, of course, is crushed rock or crushed shell, and it was mixed with the clay before the pot was formed. And what that did was it acted as a binding agent, so when it was fired, it made the pot stronger. It made the pot stronger, but... Um, the, the pots themselves were also, they were box-like in design, perhaps replicating uh, wooden boxes that the Indians had carved in, and uh, were using at the time, or wooden bowls, what have you. Um, the, uh, there were also lugs or handles that were applied to uh, many of these early woodland uh, vessels. This is something that you didn't see at least in my experience, in middle or late woodland um, eras. Now, another typical feature was um, that the, the vessels bore cord marking. And the cord mark impressions in the early woodland were both on the inside and the outside of the pot. In later eras, midland and late woodland, it was just on the outside of the pot. And these were made with a, a paddle, a wooden paddle, that was had cordage wrapped around it and uh, the entire pot was worked over with that paddle and what that accomplished was breaking up any air pockets that were in the unfired clay the left they would explode in the process of firing and totally ruin you know the entire effort that had been made but uh, these markings also give us the opportunity to make an observation that we wouldn't be able to had they not been used on the pots. And that is about the weaving techniques of these Native American people. The actual cordage, of course, uh, had been rotted away by the, you know, by time, well over 3,000 years ago in the case of the early woodland period pieces. So it, it gives us a, an insight into another occupation that they, uh, that they partook of besides the um, besides the pottery making. Um, in her extensive report, uh, Doreen Oscar, who I, whose book I just showed you, said that in the early woodland pottery making tradition um, was carried out prim primarily as a seasonal activity in the fall. And she concluded the earliest pottery making should have been naturally a seasonal act activity because Early pots were heavy, they were cumbersome, they were fragile, and would be difficult to transport from campsite to campsite. Miss Osaker suggested that as the shards were associated with the hearths, or the, uh, the, the cooking fire pit, the pottery was employed in the processing of food commodities, such as hard shell nuts in the fall. And this would have included hickory, butternut, and uh, and walnut, 
and it would have included probably uh, acorn. I know that was used in later eras. That acorn had to go through special processing because it contained a lot of tannic acid, which had to be leached out of the out of the ground up meal to make it palatable uh, for for uh, for use. Interestingly, she also suggested that since they were not used in camp moves because of their fragility, that they were likely made on spot and disposed of after, after they were done, before they moved on, because they couldn't take them with them, they would have broken. So they were disposable. They weren't something that was intended to be used for a long period of time. So it didn't matter that they weren't fired real well. They were... Uh, which is part of the reason they were fragile. Now, as we watch the evolution of pottery oh, from the early woodland to the middle woodland to the late woodland, you'll see quite a change there. The wear becomes uh, thinner, um, harder, because they fired it at higher degrees. Um, and uh, so that's interesting to watch the progression, not only of that, but of the shape of the vessels, because they got rather creative as they left the early woodland period. So, um, having said that, it's time that we take a, a look at some of the early woodland pottery pieces that I found, and I found them in the groundhog hole, along with other artifacts I showed you last week, and stone ones that I'll show you in coming weeks. So, let's take a look, okay? <clears throat> Here's the first piece I want to show you. This is actually a rim shard. Um, it's thin here, thickens as it goes up, as you can see. And this forms the, uh, the rim and the uh, upper um, lip of the, of the uh, vessel. Um, this is, I told you that the pottery of this era is very thick. And the top of the rim here is about a half an inch thick. And, well, basically overall, it, as you see, it narrows down, so I'm thinking here it's, uh, well, it's less than a half an inch, but it's, uh, it's still quite thick. Um, in this piece, it is difficult to see, because my fat fingers keep getting in the way of the light. Hold on, here we go. It's difficult to see the tempering. This piece, the tempering seems rather thin, or fine, except down at the very bottom, that that uh, uh, light section in the bottom is a large, large piece of stone. And uh, so we, uh, anyways, anyways, that is a uh, definitely rim, sh definite rim shard. Now here is a body shard. Notice the large tempering here. This would be the in interior. It's darkened um, by whatever material was being processed in it. Uh, it's uh, broken, up, as you can see. And as you look inside, you can see the, the gritty large tempering within it. Within, and... Um, uh, so the tempering is large here again, as you can see. Let's flip this over because I want you to see the other side is also darkened. But this is more likely darkened from uh, from exposure to the, to the fire, probably beside the hearth. Because I don't think these would have stood up very well actually in the hearth. So um, this measures about one and three quarters inches thick. And it's a, it's a pretty nice body shard. Now I want to show you another body shard, and again it's in two pieces. Um, this is uh, probably from the same vessel that I just showed you. I can't state that for certain, but I believe it would be. Again, let's look at the tempering. Tempering is very large, you can see here and over here. This is much thicker, though, than the other shard that I, uh, the other body shards I just showed you. And that being said, it is also, if I can put these back together here the way they belong. Um, come on, it's like doing that. Well, anyways, folks, they do go back together. There we go. But, um, this has a certain, uh, concaveness to it. 
So, um, whereas I, I told you earlier that the most of the pots were uh, box shaped, they weren't all box shaped. So this one may have had a little bit of a curve to it. Um, well, it did have because this, like I said, this is somewhat concave. Okay, next. This is a portion of a lug and it would have been a handle attached to the pot here a little piece of it's broken off here but it would have been uh, attached to a, a smaller vessel and it would have been a handle for picking up the uh, <clears throat> the pot and again it's a pinched piece the tempering is somewhat smaller here it doesn't display the surface is not quite as darkened as the other two pieces I just showed you but uh, and at its thickest point again it is about a half an inch thick now here we have two pieces that um, I believe again are parts of um, handles um, they it, it's hard to ascertain from pieces this small they could be body shards, fragmentary body shards, but I, I just get the gut feeling that they are uh, lugs or handles. And uh, the uh, smaller one here is about a quarter of an inch thick. The other one is a half inch thick. Here again, we see that the tempering in this one is very fine, but in this one you'll notice large piece of stone tempering there and then lastly I want to show you this piece which is rather unique excuse me compared to the other ones because of this reason it's fired better and its surface has worked better it's a harder pottery not from the same vessels as those pieces I just showed you uh, the surface is smooth the tempering is very fine, the color is tannish, still about a half an inch thick. It is a body shard, though I believe this too could have been a lug, and I say that because this piece that's broken off the corner there, if you extended that out, it would come to a, to a straight edge and would probably have been applied to a pot for a handle. Let me turn this over. You see this side too, um, is very smooth very nicely and uh, it has large tempering you know, see the, the large stone uh, piece of tempering right there so these a few pieces constitute the sum total of early woodland pottery that so far I have uh, been able to find these as I said earlier all came from the same groundhog hole that the um, many of the bone pieces that I showed you last week are from. So I have to thank for these again, the groundhogs. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to the middle. Let me back up for just a minute before we go on to the middle woodland. Here are some or photographs from Miss Oscar's book of early woodland pottery. Now this displays the uh, characteristic um, cord marking more so than the pieces that I that I found. And actually these from the Schultz site show really the pottery looks pretty decent compared I mean compared to what uh, some of the photos I've seen of early woodland pottery. They, they look not badly made and preserved. Uh, these are thick lugs here, um, handles, and down here are two pot bases. Now, I think that when I showed you this, this particular one, I believe in retrospect that that is a base rather than uh, just being from the concave side of a, of a pot. Then here, too are um, a few more pottery shards. These are from Schultz Thick. And 
then a few rim shards here again from the Schultz thick so I'll move on now to middle well this video is running a lot longer than I intended for it too so I am going to uh, tell you briefly the difference between middle woodland and late woodland pottery and then I'm going to show you the pottery that I have. The basic difference between middle woodland and late woodland pottery was in the method of production. In um, late woodland, or early woodland, excuse me, middle woodland pottery, it was made with the coiling method, that is to say, like a snake, like most people did when, when they were kids. And in the late woodland it was made uh, by the slab method where it was laid out and then built up. Middle woodland, you can tell frequently because when, it, when a pot broke, it broke along those coil lines. Uh, late woodland, when it broke, it was just jagged, jagged and ragged, you know, because of being made by building up. So, having said that, let's take a look at some of the, the pottery that I have. The first piece I want to show you no longer exists, but this is a picture of it. Uh, I found this... And by the way, it's late woodland. You can tell by the jagged um, edges on it. Notice the decorative motif around the upper and then on the actual lip of the pot. This was probably a child's vessel. It was the size of a small bell, actually. I found 16 pieces. I was able to assemble them. And uh, the only near-complete pot that I've ever found here in Michigan. I said it was destroyed. Unfortunately, sometimes history... And prehistory falls victim to people like my ex-wife and the jealous men that she took up with after I was gone because one of them smashed it because it had belonged to me. Now here again, <clears throat> excuse me, we are looking at some late woodland pottery shards and a few rim shards. These were all from my old Lunette and Creek site up in Oscoda, Michigan, as was that child's pot that I just showed you. Again, these are quite obviously late woodland because of the jagged breaks on the pieces you'll see these two these three decorated pieces in the middle they were from the upper portion of the pot and then as we move over here a nice rim shard with incised lines on the very top of the rim uh, this is would have been a more elaborate one with deeply incised cord lines cord impression lines and uh, and a row of punctates underneath of it and that's where a stick was poked into the pottery. It was, a, I believe it was a punctate if it was pushed in. And it was a dentate if it was pushed out from the inside. Okay. Uh, another interesting little rim shard here. That shows that the cord was actually impressed around the very top of the, of the, uh, of the pot. And then these two pieces are, uh, are just, not just, but they're body shards. This photographic image, if I can get it focused in, is exactly how I found this pottery lined up in the sand at the Goodwin Gresham site in Muscoda, Michigan, where it had been for at least a thousand years. It is middle woodland. You can see that the pieces in the ground um, are, I wish I could get that coming clearer for you, uh, were broke on the coil mark, and the piece laying off to the side is actually a rim shard from that same vessel. Is the only time I ever found them lined up like that. The wind blows across that site very extensively sometimes and it, un, un, it reveals uh, pottery and lithic materials quite often. Now here's a selection of small shards. Uh, there are two rim pieces put together at the top and sized lines at the top which you can see for decorative motif. Uh, all the rest are body shards. These are a mix of uh, middle woodland and late woodland. Um, here's a, a middle woodland with the coil break, another middle woodland over here with the coil break. Um, so another one down here is a good example with example that has the coil break. And um, you'll see cord impressed pottery like this piece here. I talked to you about the cord impressions and the cord by a paddle when we were looking at the early woodland uh, just a few moments ago. And so uh, judging from the, the rim pieces, though, because uh, um, they are so distinctively different between pots, I actually found the remains of over 1,500 prehistoric pots based on different rim shards, which are now housed in the 
collections of the Ascota Osavo Historical Society up in Ascota. Clay was often, or fire clay was often used to make smoking pipes with. This is a, a smoking pipe. Uh, the top, obviously, is the outside of it. They decorated the top of the pipe bowl quite nicely. And on the bottom one, you can see inside of it. And it, it would appear that uh, it was made around a core of a piece of wood that had been whittled down into an almost cone shape to make the uh, to make the bowl itself. This was found by my friends, who I haven't seen in many, many years, William and Sarah Thurman from Waterford, Michigan. But they found it at the uh, Goodwin Gresham site there in Ascoda. Well, this is not the greatest image. This shows pottery that I found in an insular area of Old Lennon Creek in Ascoda, Michigan. It was different than anything else that we found there because of how deeply incised it was and how thick it was and how heavy the tempering was. Um, it looked to me at the time when I found it that it was Iroquois in origin. Iroquois would be out on the east coast of the United States, northeast coast. I had it looked at by an archaeologist at the Castle Museum in Saginaw, James Payne, years ago, and he had done his study work uh, up in New England, and he verified that it indeed was Iroquois in pottery. probably came here as a trade item in the late wood. Now this is me back in the day when I was not old and ugly, wait, young and ugly, no I wasn't ugly, um, but this was working at a site in my backyard where we found hundreds and hundreds of pottery shards and uh, that was, I can't remember this, it was, I think it was the summer of 1986 or 1987 and that was on Van Letten Lake there in Oscoda, Michigan. That's all I have to show you this time. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I know it's been a little bit longer than usual. But thank you for watching. I hope you'll be back next week when we'll take another look, or excuse me, a look at another interesting subject. God bless y'all. Love y'all. And thanks for 